investment. So compound interest using recursion is quite time consuming. So what if we wanted to do it without recursion? Uh, thankfully, we have a formula for that, so we can do it. And this is a formula that many of you are probably familiar with. So AM equals P open bracket one plus I close bracket to the power of N. So what do these variables mean? So first, P is the principal, uh, and that's the initial quantity. So if, for example, we had like $20,000 in a bank account, then that would be the principal. That's like our starting point. Uh, and then I uh, is X divided by M, uh, where X is the interest rate per annum, so again, yearly, and then M is the number of compounds per year. And this is like what I highlighted before. I wanted to just quickly mention again uh, that it's really important to notice or to be very cautious about how we are actually defining our variables. Because again, it's not about what letters we use because sometimes that changes from formula to formula because here I has to be that value there, but I is actually equal to this. So we can't have I in the same position that it was last time. So it's really, really important not to trip up and make a mistake when you're defining your different variables and values. It's not important to memorize what I is, what X is, what M is, or if you do have consistent letters that you use for this in your own study or in the own rules that you use, then that's awesome. Keep running with that. Uh, but the most important thing, again, is to remember and define uh, what, what it is we're actually doing. So here, we're saying that I is equal to the in the decimal interest rate per annum divided by the number of compounding periods, like how we defined R before. We're just talking about it a little bit differently. But when we defined R in a recursion, we said one plus the decimal interest rate per annum divided by the number of compounds uh, per year. But here, we actually don't have a one plus because that one is already built into the compound interest formula. So make sure you don't add another one or it'll end up being 2.0 something and that would be quite a high rate of interest. Uh, so yes, make sure you take that into account. So yes, P principal, our initial value, um, one plus the decimal rate of interest divided by the number of compound periods per year so yeah, number of compounds per year, and then to the power of n, which is the total number of compounds. So say, for example, uh, we had a loaner investment that was compounding uh, monthly, so 12 times per year, over a three-year time period. That would mean n would be equal to 12 times 3, which is 36, because the total number of compounds in this loaner investment would be 36. Because that means it's compounding 36 times because it's compounding every single month uh, for three years, which 36 months is how we get 36 compounds. So let's do a question to kind of illustrate a little bit further. So let's go back to our scenario where we had $1,000 as our initial value and it was compounding monthly for two years, so 24 compounds total, um, at 6% per annum. Let's define our variables. So P, principal, initial starting value was $1,000 that we had. And I, our, it was defined as our decimal rate of interest per annum which was 6%, so we get 0.06 because we take 6 and divide it by 100 to get our 0.06, and then we divide it by 12 because that's our number of compounds. So we can see that our I is 0.005, which is what we found um, R was 1.005 in our previous question. And then, like I said, N is going to be 24 because compounding monthly over two years. And then we can substitute into our formula. So we've substituted in the value for P, the value for I, and the value for N. And then all we need to do is put that in our calculator and solve for it. And we can see that we actually got the same answer we got when we used recursion. This was just a much quicker process than having to apply the same rule 24 times over. Whereas here, we only had to fill in the one formula. So that is the beauty of the compound interest formula. So we're going to do a practice question now from one of the NEEP trial exams, uh, which are really good resources if you're after some practice questions to do. So this one says, a person wishes to put $2,000 into a saving account and they want to receive $600 of interest. 
So we're being told different information this time, which is interesting. Uh, the interest rate we're told is 3.15% per annum, and we're told that we have monthly compounds, all really important information. So we're told to calculate the number of years and months it will take for the person to receive $600 of interest. So interesting, we've been given different variables this time. So we're still going to start with our same starting point, A equals P, 1 plus I to the power of N. But here, A is not our unknown. We actually know what they want A to be. They want to, they're going to put $2,000 in to begin with, and they want to receive $600 worth of interest. So their desired end goal amount for this investment is the initial amount plus how much they want to earn in interest. So the goal amount in this scenario is $2,600. We also know P, the principal, because we're told how much they're going to invest. So we know that the starting point is $2,000. And we can also calculate I. They've arranged their formula slightly differently here, but it's still the same effect as what we've been talking about. So what they've done uh, is they've taken uh, the, uh, the, well, the interest rate per annum, which is 3.15%, and then think of it like they've divided it by 100 and they've also divided it by 12, which is the number of compounds per year. So they've done the exact same process. They've just set it out a little bit differently. So we've calculated I, um, and then that's what we know. So now we can substitute it into our formula. We know that A is $2,600. We know that P is 2,000. We know that in our brackets, we'll have one plus the value for I. And then we'll also, uh, that all just leaves us with N as our unknown, which makes sense because the question is asking us to calculate the number of years and months it'll take for the person to receive $600 of interest. So the unknown is the time period. So that's the N. So that's what we're trying to find out. So what they've done to simplify this is they've just divided each side by 2000 so that we can isolate more of our variables. So we took 2600 and divided it by 2000. We divided this side by 2000 as well, and that cancelled out. So we're left with one point, our I value to the power of N. And now to solve for N, we're actually getting used trial and error, which is a totally appropriate method to try and find the value of N, because otherwise we'd need to use like logarithms and that gets really complicated. And we actually don't learn that in general math. So that's not actually a way that we need to use to solve the problem. So to use trial and error, we choose different values for n. We're going to say let n equal this, and we'll see if that works for our equation. So, for example, what if we let n equal 5? Well, if we put this number to the power of 5, it would equal 1.0131, and it would the number would go on. But that's way, way lower than 1.3. So, And we know that's nowhere near equals to. So we know that that n value is going to be far too low. And then what if we said we'll let n equal 200? That would give us 1.68, which is way too high. So we know it's going to be less than 200. What if we try n equals 100? That would give us 1.2997, which is really, really close to 1.3. But that means we still haven't hit 1.3. So that means we're still not at the right point. What if we let n equal 101? Then that would give us 1.3031 and it would go over and then dot, dot, dot. And that is just over the required value. So we know that n equals 101 will meet the requirements of the equation that we're looking at. So that means uh, when the money, our initial quantity, has compounded 101 times, it will take, that is how long it will take them to reach the desired amount. And because we're talking about monthly compounds here, n equaling 101 means that it will take 101 months for them to reach $2,600. And we can actually convert that into months and years. So therefore, it will take eight years and five months to receive $2,600. And that will give them their desired goal of that $600 of interest. So that's how I would approach a question such as this one. So it's important to note that we, we don't just need to use the compound interest formula for loans or investments where the amount is unknown. We Like with any other formula, we can actually rearrange it and solve other variables. So that's one question example there. 
So in some questions, you might be asked to compare multiple interest rates like we've already talked a little bit about. You might be asked, well, which one's the better value, this one or this one? And I've already mentioned that a higher or lower interest rate or more or less compounds per year would be, uh, and we've talked about what you'd choose depending on whether it's a loan or an investment. But what if we have different interest rates per annum and different compounding periods, then it's going to be really hard to compare them on equal footing. So for example, should I invest at 6.1% per annum compounding annually, or should I invest at 5.95% compounding weekly? Well, this first option looks better because it's got a higher interest rate. And I know that if there's a higher interest rate, that means I'll get more money back on my return. But I also know that more frequent compounds per year means that I'll get more money back on my investment. So should I choose this option because it's got more compounds per, uh, it's got more compounds. So because we have the different rates of interest and the different number of compounds per year, it's actually really difficult to know like which option to choose. And that's where the effective annual rate of interest formula comes in, which you've probably heard about. So this, the effective annual rate of interest is the annual interest rate that would generate the same amount of interest with one single compound per year as that generated by the original loan. So what we're asking is what is the annual rate of interest that would generate me the same amount of interest if this loan or investment only had one compounding period. So for example, to get to compare these two options on equal footing, we'd say, well, okay, we know that 6.1% uh, per annum compounding annually would give us a certain amount. But if we took the effective annual rate of interest, what that would do is this formula would practically in essence convert 5.95% compounding weekly, it's asking effectively what rate of interest would generate the same amount of interest as if we just had one compound per annum. And then by finding out that value, we can then compare the other values on equal footing. And this is a formula that we use for that. Um, and M is the number of compounds per year in that formula there. So let's look at an example. So Sam borrowed $50,000 from the bank at an interest rate of 3.9% per annum. So that's his current uh, rate of interest. And remember, he's borrowing it. So it's a loan. He doesn't want to pay back lots of interest. He wants the cheaper option. Uh, and it's compounding fortnightly. So we've got 26 compounds per year. And he makes fortnightly repayments of $600. But that's actually not relevant to this current question. The bank asks if Sam would like to instead have 3.8% per annum, which is a lower interest rate, but taking compounding weekly. So it would compound more often. So it's a, a lower rate of interest, which is awesome news, but it would be compounding more often. It would be compounding 52 times a year instead of 26 times a year. So how is Sam going to know which to choose? Should he accept this offer or stick with what he's currently doing? So let's use our effective annual rate of interest formula to determine that. So I effective will have a look first at the 3.9% per annum option. So here you see the I is our decimal rate of interest and you can see here in the I effective formula that it already takes into account the number of compounds per year. So I in the annual effective rate of interest formula is simply the decimal rate of interest per annum. That's all we need to know for that bit. So for his first option, the option he's currently on, it's 3.9% per annum, so 0 0.039, divided by the number of compounds per year, and because it's compounding fortnightly, that's 26, uh, and then also to the power of the number of compounds per year, which again is 26. So the effective annual rate of interest, when we solve that and put it through the calculator, is 3.974% per annum. So effectively, if this first option was just to have one compound per year, this is the percent of interest per annum that would produce the same amount of money. So now let's do the same process for the second amount so that then we can compare them on equal footing and help Sam make his decision. So same formula, but here 
our a decimal rate of interest is 0.038 because that's the other interest rate he was offered. Uh, and then our compounds per annum is 52 because he was also offered weekly compounds. So that's 52 times a year. Again, we solve it, we put it through the calculator, and that gives us an annual effective interest rate of 3.872. So the annual effective rate of interest for the second option he was offered is actually more beneficial for him because effectively, when we convert them both to annual per annum rates of interest, uh, this one is actually lower. And because Sam is borrowing money, so it's a loan, so he's having to pay back this interest, then yes, he should accept the second offer because that is actually better value considering the fact that it's a loan. So I hope that made sense for that question and hopefully Sam will be able to make some money back on that option. So yes, if I was Sam, I would definitely accept that offer because it was it's effectively a lower rate of interest, which is good news when you have a loan. But so we've been talking about compound interest, but what if we don't want to wait until the end to pay my loan out? We've been talking about scenarios where we have a loan and the interest um, accrues over two years, for example, and then we've got this lump sum and then you pay it out. But what if, for example, we wanted to make monthly repayments instead, which is actually quite normal for loans in real life. People often make weekly or monthly or fortnightly repayments on a car loan or a house loan. And that gradually reduces the balance of the loan over time rather than just paying it out all at the end. And an interesting thing to note is that this actually tends to reduce how much interest you pay overall. So if you let it compound again and again and again and wait until the loan grows and grows and grows, and then you just choose to pay it out in one lump sum all at the end, it's, that means you're actually probably going to end up paying a little bit more interest. Whereas if you make monthly repayments, the amount that they're charging interest on is slowly getting smaller and smaller. So you'll actually end up paying less interest overall in the long run, which is good news for a loan. So again.